Beginning. Kneeling in a pool of blood, a girl bound by an energy ring begs for help. Lowering her tired eyes and crying, Alto calls for help. The building is burning. The powerless girl waits for help. The boy runs up to her and holds out his hand. As he gets closer to the girl, Alto freezes with his arm outstretched. He can't move. The guy is confused, not understanding anything. Forcing his arm and leg to move, Alto is perplexed. The girl continues to call for help. A hooded man appears and says that Alto won't make it. It's all useless. The man who appears is happy and gloats that the guy can't even scream. Suddenly, the stranger envelops the boy in a purple haze, trying to subdue him, smiling in the process. The hooded man gathers the energy into an orb, saying that life, the immutable law of Forturnia, and that Alto was born with too little life. The enemy raises the energy ball above his head and begins to thrash at the girl, who is still bound and without strength, telling the guy to watch silently. Watching all this, the guy with fear in his eyes mentally begs him to stop and not to kill the girl. The enemy, smiling evilly, releases a stream of energy towards the girl. The guy struggles to break out of his stupor, begging to stop. The girl doesn't even watch what's happening. Powerless, she cries. The enemy releases a stream of energy into the defenseless girl. From the force of the blow, his cloak ripples. The blow hits the girl in the heart, causing her head to fall back. From helplessness, the guy also cried, realizing that he cannot help. He is shocked by what is happening. He lost his beloved. Studying books, Alto begins to look for a way to revive Hannah, the girl who died at the hands of the enemy. Seriously trotting around the world, falling and rising, moving forward. Guy has heard rumors that he needs to defeat a dragon, but doesn't know that he's level 99. Until the age of 55, the man does not give up trying to find a way to resurrect his beloved. Tired and wounded, he can't believe that with his experience, he still can't win, himself having reached the 99th level. He manages to defeat the dragon, but in his mind, he thinks that he will not return, at least not to his loved ones. Defeating it, he drops his sword. Losing the rest of his strength, Alto falls to his knees, thinking of Hannah, telling her to believe in how hard he tried. But in the end, he was alone. Then he falls to the floor and passes out. When he opens his eyes, he sees the image of his beloved, remembers that there wasn't a moment when he didn't think of her. He remembers how much fun they had together and how happy he was, even lying on the grass. Alto feels sorry and apologizes to Hannah for having nothing to give. He was very close to his goal. From his last strength, the man moves his life energy into the vessel. Present tense. A place has been prepared under the tree. There's a chair and a table. On the chair is a blob of energy. An hourglass shows that time is up. The little boy looks at that ball of energy, thanking Alto. That boy is Alto. The orb asks how his life has been and informs him that he is in Forturnia's paradise. The boy realizes, guesses, that he has died. Alto receives the god's tear and is informed that the man who got here is worthy of it, as enough time has passed. The tear ends up in the boy's chest, and he questions what it is and where it was before him. Alto is granted the magic of resurrection and told that he can live his life anew. Not believing his ears in wonder, he asks again if it is actually possible to live again. Char suggests taking Alto on a vacation, if you can call it that. The boy's soul seems to have worn out, but he denies it. Again, he wants to live life anew again. There is no doubt about that. He now confidently states that he wants to live life anew. Char agrees to Alto's request and decides to change the boy's fate. But there is a condition, only one chance for twenty years, also Char warns. The force of fate is incredibly powerful, and life will run out before it can be controlled. Does Alto want to start over? He wondered. Once again, the image of a smiling and happy Hannah flashed before his eyes. Alto responds with determination and shows that he is ready to save the girl. Char accepts the boy's determination and finally gets off the chair and flies towards Alto. After asking for a moment of time, Char circled around the young man and wanted to hear his true desire and thrust into his chest. Shock and pain engulfed Alto. Falling into the darkness, he heard that everything was starting over. The rest he would remember. There was no other choice but to endure, making an effort to fulfill the wish. Fate must be defied. Slowly opening his eyes, the boy saw two smiling silhouettes, male and female. Waking up, Alto looks at his hand and realizes that he is now a baby. So in the body of a baby, his second life with his mom and dad begins. Finally waking up, with an uncomprehending look, Alto looked at his young and joyful parents, who were cheerfully calling his name. Daddy says wake up and mommy says good morning. The child is puzzled still not believing what is happening. Finally, he finally realizes what has happened to him, confusion in his eyes. Mom talks about the sun shining outside, and Dad calls for a walk. When the realization finally came, Alto mentally cried out that he was a baby, 
Trying to move and talk, the baby doesn't get anywhere, only flailing his arms and making baby noises. A cute, ruddy baby, one of the parents poked him with a finger on his chubby cheek. With eyes full of love and smiles on their faces, the parents reach out to him, calling him baby and wanting to hug him. Mom grabs Alto, holds him close to her and says reproachfully that she will wake up the baby. Dad, however, replies that he will then put him to bed. Mom cannot stand it, with great happiness hugs the baby tighter. Alto only hums. In the body of an infant sits the adult mind. Can't say words, the throat is not yet fully developed. Alto is back in a time when mommy had long hair and daddy hadn't grown a beard yet. Beautifully, the boy is reborn, now gazing out the window with his family. Lying in his mother's arms, he thinks about his new life and that not a second should be lost. Alto lies quietly in his crib and thinks about how uncomfortable the baby's body is. The mother, smiling and humming a song, prepares to eat. But the baby thinks his body is underdeveloped and he wants to walk first of all. After much effort stretching out his arm, Alto finally manages to turn around. Turning around, the kid sees a strange screen with level one stats. On it, all skills are zero. The kid doesn't realize what it is. On the screen is his name. Across from life is a star. Profession is operator. Talent is creator. While Alto was fiddling, his mother came up and asked him what he had there, still smiling the same way. The kid flinched in surprise. Looking at mom, the baby hums, but mom decides he needs a diaper change. Moving his gaze to the screen, Alto realizes that he's the only one seeing this, and mom doesn't seem to see it. The monitor shows the ability statuses, muscle and physical strength are equal to level one. Alto decides to assess the standard of living of the church. He had never heard that you can translate abilities into a numerical equivalent. The boy thinks about it and begins to remember what it might have been like back then, when he was communicating with the orb, whether there was information. Indeed, while on the mountain under the tree, the orb communicated that it would allow Alto to choose his special tenju. The boy doesn't understand what this means and looks questioningly at the orb. The orb explains to him that tenju are given to people with a natural gift, genius, warrior, magician, technician, or creator. The orb assumes Alto's natural power is genius and asks if he wants to keep it. The kid hesitates and refuses as he wants to be a creator. Looking at the screen, the kid ponders that there are only five natural gifts in the world, but he has never heard of the gift of creator. Alto looks at the screen, titillated, and wants to see what he can do. A slide opens showing the natural skill of creation, and it is unique. The kid is surprised as he studies the monitor and begins to sort things out and sees all the states of affairs. The boy is determined and smiles, because if he learns everything, he will raise the level and that's great. While Alto has the worst rating, one with one star, he will have to try harder. With his best efforts, Alto tries to stand up, thinking he doesn't have time to raise his rating. The mom turns to the baby and he is trying hard to get up. She's surprised. The woman talks about Alto trying to get up and the father says he's never seen babies do that. Both parents are surprised. Dad and mom kneel in front of the crib with a plea to take it slow that Alto needs to grow up some more. The baby at this time sat up holding onto the edge of the crib. Gathering all his strength, Alto continues to rise, asking his mom for forgiveness, for he has no time at all. Flashback, the house of death. A magician is aiming an energy ball at Hannah. He has 15 years to live, during which time he must become stronger than that mage. Continuing to rise, persevering, believing there was not a second to lose. The boy stood up looking at his mom and remembers that he lost more than just his beloved back then. Rising up and looking at his mom's smiling face, Alto stopped. And his mom asked what was wrong with him. She noticed the sad face of the little boy. Parents do not understand what is happening to their son. He reached out and grasped his mom's hands with both hands. There is sadness in the baby's eyes. He embarrassingly clung tighter to his mother. Flashback. Eight years after Alto was born, his parents died in the forest. He lost them. Someone had mauled them badly. The parents die when the boy was eight years old. A horde of goblins suddenly appear and attack the settlement. The monsters attack Alto's village for the first time. The father grabbed a sword to protect the seven, while the mother asks to leave her and the child, herself covering her son with her body. Alto is racked with fright and fear of death. Tears appear in his eyes. Mom in horror grabbed the child and ran away with him. The goblins in front of Alto attack the father. Watching what is happening, the child stretches his hand towards his father and calls out to him, but his mother continues to run with him without turning around. The goblins overpower Dad. He falls to the ground, bleeding, dropping his weapon from his hand. Mom continues to run with her son in her arms, comforting him and saying that she will help him. As they continue running down the forest path, 
Neither Alto nor his mother notices the goblins sitting on the branches of the trees. The goblins leap from above the running mother and son, the woman clutching her child in terror. Turning around, the mother notices the green clawed paws of the monsters reaching for them. The mother's eyes reflect the approach of the goblins, her pupils dilating. She forcefully pushes Alto away from her. The boy squirms and screams as he flies away from her. The boy finds himself at a safe distance and looks towards his mother. Two goblins have his mother pinned to the ground. She can't get out of their clutches. Lying on the ground in the monster's clutches, the mother orders Alto to run and confidently declares that she can handle it. The boy is panicked, dazed, and unable to move from his seat as he watches what is happening. The goblins drooling and with burning eyes continue to hover over his mother. Alto grits his teeth, realizing he is powerless. With a desperate look, he begins to cry. Gathering his will in his fist, Alto rushes away from the goblins and his mom. The woman cries and apologizes to her son, saying she loves him very much. Hearing his mother's last words, Alto ran faster, overcoming his fear. Clinging to the surprised mother, the child regretfully remembers that then he could not do anything. Full of determination, the baby decides this time, the second life to save mom and dad, because it's time to become stronger. The child has grown up. Started reading books, the status of intelligence and strength begins to increase. Having read, the kid did not notice how mom came and started to take away the book. He is surprised. The mom took the book away, telling him to give it back. She is not happy that the toddler has taken to learning early. The boy pulls his hand out to let her know he needs the book. Dad appears in the room with a lamp in his hand, but it is not lit. Noticing his father's inability to light the lamp, Alto begins to exercise his powers, reaching out his hand towards the lamp. Energy builds up in his hand. Suddenly the ramp in his hand bursts into flames and ignites. The father is surprised and looks at it in bewilderment. A screen pops up, showing the increase in status. Magical power has increased and new opportunities have opened up. Outside, a boy draws a bunny in the sand, and a girl smilingly watches the process. The attention of the boys was attracted by a noise. They looked surprised in the direction from where it was emitted. Scared of what is happening, the children hid behind a tree. This is Alto, practicing in speed and in avoiding obstacles, he is carrying very fast. The children look out from behind the tree, mesmerized by Alto, thinking he is cool. He whizzes past them, deftly pushing himself off the wall. The boy's status indicators are rising rapidly. Strength, magic, skill, and night skill. Sitting under a tree on a rock, Alto meditates, gathering natural energy and not noticing a bird perched on his shoulder. In the blink of an eye, eight years flew by. Mom set the table with various dishes and called Alto over. The boy has grown, grown strong, and is being congratulated on his eighth birthday. He stands and smiles. The happy mom cradles her son in her arms and proudly says he has grown up. Alto is embarrassed, telling his mom she's going to crush him. Dad declared that the son is a handsome guy. All went to his father and suggested starting an apprenticeship with Alto. Mom supported, saying it's a great idea. Agreeing with Dad, Mom congratulated her son and allowed him to go to church in the evening. Alto exclaimed joyfully in agreement. In the church, everyone who turns eight years old is given special bracelets, a kind of identity card. Alto stands in front of the church attendant waiting to receive his bracelet. The minister smilingly announces that the boy is eight years old and asks him to hold out his hands. Alto receives a magic bracelet proving his identity. He is advised to be careful not to lose the bracelet and that it is better to go to the big city with it. Finally, the boy receives the bracelet, clenching his hand into a fist. He prepares for the arrival of the monsters because they will appear in a few hours. The boy remembers how he ran in tears and in fear from the monsters. He needs to bring himself to his senses. Alto is ready for the upcoming battle with the goblins. The time has come. There is no fear in his gaze now. He is confident in himself. The guy has gone outside. He is waiting for the monsters. Standing confidently, fists clenched, determined to save this village. Leaning back against a tree, Alto opens the skill board to see his status. The boy needs to reach level 15 and increase his strength. He only has 32 magic. Alto knows how to use the skills he has accumulated over 8 years and notices a new item, an ability he hasn't activated. The guy thought about it. There was no skill to create various functional objects before. His imagination drew several objects, a chair, a hammer, a saw. Upon reflection, Alto concludes that creating objects in combat is not a hindrance to him. Hearing a noise, the lad turned around sharply, wary and surprised, looking in the direction of the noise. The goblins had fallen silent, hiding in the grass and preparing to attack the village. Alto's gaze read read readiness for battle and a thirst for revenge for the loss of his loved ones. 
he realized the goblins were here. The goblins begin to leave their hiding places with nasty smirks on their faces. The monsters are out, looking around for prey, holding clubs and knives in their paws. Alto stands tensely behind a tree, watching the goblins, assessing the situation. The boy noticed that only three goblins came. Most likely they are scouts. The boy got excited and began to calm himself because he had defeated many monsters in the past. One of the goblins noticed Alto hiding behind a tree. His arm and part of his head were exposed. The goblin who had spotted the child signaled to his fellow goblin that he had found him, and the goblin opened his mouth to salivate. One of the goblins rushed towards the boy. The other two stayed behind, but Alto was ready for the attack. The boy calmed down and gathered himself. He was about to have his first fight in his second life. Alto concentrated on building up his energy. Time to show what he had learned. He practiced every day. The enemy attacked, leaping from above, and the boy had already gathered a ball of energy in his hand and ready to fight back. This time, he would have no regrets this time. Energy swirled in Alto's hand. He prepared for a counterattack. He took aim and summoned a flame. With a powerful strike of his fiery palm, he hit the center of the goblin's goody. The boy knocked out the monster with a single blow. He flew back to his kin who stood aside. This was the first time the boy used the flame call, and he succeeded. The second goblin attacks the boy, but he instantly dodges it while twisting the fire energy in his hand. Alto thinks he did a pretty good job on the first goblin, but it's not enough, hitting the second monster right in the head with the fire. At the same time, the guy is attacked from behind by a third goblin. Having lost his comrades, he is furious. Alto notices him too, dodges quickly and deftly. The monster with the club misses. The boy jumps up and is about to strike back before the monster turns around. Alto has once again gathered fire energy. He must not make a mistake. The goblin turns around at the boy. He sees a bright light. An explosion rumbles through. Two monsters lie defeated unconscious, a haze of cinders emanating from them. Alto stands over the defeated three monsters, exhaling with relief. In this fight, the guy realized that he needed to step up his attacks, and he was lucky he hadn't encountered any more monsters. The stats screen appeared by itself. Alto looked at it in bewilderment. The boy's level had increased, which he was very happy about. Not only had he defeated the monsters, but he had also leveled up. With the level increase, the boy felt as if he was drunk, dizzy. The bushes rustled again. Alto turned around in surprise at the noise. Another goblin jumped out at him, fast and embittered. With tremendous force, the monster swung and struck Alto in the arm. The boy screamed in pain. The boy fell to his knees, looked at the goblin with an angry look picked up one monster's knife and wounded, prepared to attack again. One lightning-fast lunge, and the knife is already in the belly of the goblin. The monster opened its mouth. Alto pushed up and cut the monster in half with his knife. Again, there was a noise. The boy turned around. What he saw made him despair. Damn it, the crowd of monsters had taken the boy by surprise. With an injured arm, Alto can't fight, and there are plenty of monsters. In the past, at the same time the irreparable happened, the boy remembered it. The pictures of past events changed one after another. His parents and Hannah killed. Nothing ever changed no matter how much he fought. The mob of evil and hungry monsters continued to advance. Alto could not change his fate. The image of his beloved and smiling Hannah came to mind again. Alto gripped his wounded arm, refusing to give up. He gathered himself and noticed that his level had increased, and he had to try harder. The skill has increased. He is now a grave reaper. It's a crafting skill. The kid is surprised. Alto noticed that the magic power will appear when the level increases. That's why he can't use it. The goblins look greedily at the boy, seeing him as a weakling. They prepare to attack. The boy is sure that the goblins only see him as a weakness and not his fighting skills. Now he wonders what the goblins can do to him. One of the goblins snapped out of his seat, jumped up and rushed towards Alto to attack. The guy barely dodged. The blow was fast and too close. It even scared him. Gathering the energy in his palms again, the boy prepared to counterattack with a fireball. Releasing the ball into the crowd of goblins, several of them burst into flames. It's hard for Alto to fight with a cut hand, but he keeps on, but he keeps on fighting. The number of goblins grows. These nasty things get bigger and attack the boy in droves. The number of monsters has increased eight times. The boy is clearly tired from the battle. Alto has a trump card up his sleeve, with the power of which he can fight off the goblins. The main thing to believe in their strength. The boy begins to gather energy into a large energy ball. One of the goblins attacks Alto from behind. The boy tries to fight back with his free hand while shouting the word grave. After yelling, the ground beneath the monster started to fail and the goblins started to fall under the ground. One by one, the goblins began to disappear into the darkness of the pit that Alto had created and finally disappeared from view altogether. Staying in a state of shock, 
The guy could not believe what was happening. Not a single monster was left. Alto wonders to himself if he was really able to handle all the goblins. The boy looks at the result of his magic. In front of him is a huge and deep pit. It is the grave. Looking at his hand, the boy can't believe he has gained such abilities, namely the skill of crafting. Silence ensues. Alto looks at the hand like this, rejoicing, for he has done it, defeated the monsters and protected the village. Now the guy really believed that fate could change and his family would be alive. After all, he had saved the village. Resting by the pit, continuing to sit, Alto victoriously clenched his fist and raised his hand up. The guy was finally happy. He had succeeded, exhaling a sigh of relief. Alto's skills immediately went up a few levels. He assumes that so many upgrades are due to defeating the monsters. And then the boy's face changes. Since he's leveled up, something must be happening to his body. Suddenly, pain shoots through the boy and he presses himself against the rock, screaming. He had heard that if there is a way to move up a level, the level increases. Alto faints, thinking about the question of whether this is the increasing love. Opening his eyes, the boy feels cold and there is someone flying near his face. Finally waking up, the boy stares in surprise at a certain entity that looks like a drop of water. Protecting himself with his hand, the boy hurled himself away from the slime-like creature. Looking closer, Alto notices that the slime is beautiful and gradually calms down. The slime tries to convey something to the guy, but he just stares at it for now. The slime shows the guy that there is a liquid in it and lets him know that he needs to drink it. Alto took the drink offered by the slime in his palm. The life-giving moisture cooled the boy's hands. The boy hesitantly put his palms to his lips and drank the contents in a gulp. Alto got satisfaction from the offered drink. A satisfied smile appeared on his face. The slime jumps in front of the boy and makes noises, trying to say something. Alto doesn't understand it and sits with his palms open. The boy asks the slime what it is. It looks like a blob of mass that has a core in the center. Sitting by the rock, the boy, without changing his posture, looks questioningly at the slime and realizes that it does not look like a dangerous monster, and it is friendly enough. Hearing the boy's words, the slime decided to prove that it is not an enemy and became like a pet pet caresses and presses against his cheek, showing the same tenderness. Birds are flying across the sky. The sky is clear and clean. One bird, not being frightened, flew in and sat next to the boy's hand. Sitting on a rock with slime on his lap, the boy points to the village where he was born, a nice little place surrounded by nature. The slime moved, made a sound, but Alto smilingly said he would not come back here again. Alto imagines his girl alive, young, beautiful, and tells the slime stroking her that there is a man he must save. The boy continues stroking the slime and admits that he's still weak and that all his efforts are futile. The creature on its knees makes noises. Alto tells the creature that about a mile away from them is the city of Kinotogris, one of the best underground cities. As the story continues, Alto tells the creature of the goal they need to capture the upper floors and that he wants to raise the level there as much as possible. Each level is filled with different monsters. The higher the level, the scarier the enemy and more dangerous the enemy. As he talks about his plans, Alto holds the lump in his lap as if he understands what he is saying. He tells him that that day is seven years away. The boy starts to rise. The lump with the core jumps off his lap and hangs in the air. Alto returns home and mentally apologizes to his parents for leaving so suddenly. The boy made a list of tasks to accomplish no matter what. He thought this is the end. He has to fix everything and he really needs to. The child looks at the picture where the whole family is happy, smiling and hugging. He thanks his parents for surrounding him with love and he is glad he grew up with them. Alto tearfully says goodbye to the house. He is glad he grew up in this family. Eight years have passed and he is happy. The boy decides right now to go on the road and become free as a bird in the sky. On the way, Alto notices that the slime is following him and asks if it is following him, warning him that it is dangerous and he will go alone. The boy discourages the lump from traveling as the monsters are hard to defend against. Slime shows protests and Alto gives in and lets her stay with him. The slime stays with the boy and he decides to come up with a name for it. He asks what to call it. The slime jumps up, letting him know what name he wants. A month later, the companions are attacked by a wolf-like monster. Growling, it rushed forward. Alto dodged it, confidently and easily dissecting the enemy with his weapon. After the battle with the wolf, Alto looks nonchalantly in its direction and remembers to eat his lunch while continuing to hold his weapon in his hand. The boy saw the slime bring him a glittering night wolf stone. With a smile, he thanked her. The companions had accumulated a whole bag of magical gemstones, the slime helping Alto stack them. Now they didn't have to worry about the expense. The slime jumped and started making noises to attract attention. 
The boy looked over and noticed that the companion had found them a place to sleep for the night. Slime climbed on top of Alto's head. The pair looked out from behind the rock, surprised to see a place that could be a place to sleep. Walking into a cave-like place, the boy said it was just right for their resting place. Spacious and hidden from view, the pair settled Dem in the cave, deciding to rest here tonight. It was beginning to get dusk. Alto should get to Kinotogris tomorrow. Everything was going according to his plan. The travelers were hungry and roasted large chunks of fresh meat over an open fire, on a stick. Slime stood like a sentry, watching the cooking process. The fat on the meat is squishing from the fire. The sticks dug into the ground to keep them off. Alto straight off the sticks devours the meat. Good thing the monsters in the neighborhood are rank. You can easily find food, even without the combat the boy is used to. The boy picked up a stone with one hand and realized that his body was finally like his past life self, fast growing unbeatable. The boy gathered several stone slabs of different sizes and sat down to meditate. One could level up more efficiently in the dungeon. Alto busied himself with several things at once. He held a stone with one hand and took his food with the other, while sitting balancing on a pyramid of stones. The boy was doing all of these things to keep himself busy and get stronger. Just then, food popped into his mouth, which stunned the boy. Slime, not knowing how to help his comrade, decided to feed him, shoving meat into the boy's mouth. Suddenly, the slime curled up on Alto's lap, put the meat in a mouth-like place with its tail, and began to eat. Once satiated, the slime showed that it had gained strength and was ready for new adventures. Noticing this behavior of the slime for the first time, Alto offered to eat the rice and asked if she was eating everything. The puzzlement on Alto's face was replaced with amusement. Covering his eyes, he smirked. The boy suggests the slime find something to inspire her and said he was glad to see them. He also asked if the slime was a predator. The slime jumped in denial. At this time, the friends are watched by the girl. She hides behind a rock and took a step to give away her presence. Alto sensed the danger, turned sharply towards the uninvited guest, without a shadow of fear. In an instant, the stick that served as a meat skewer flew towards the stranger. Turning around completely, Alto saw that there was no one behind him. The stick hit the wall and with a quiet sound fell to the floor. The guy armed himself with a knife. He readied himself for the enemy's attack realizing that the stranger was quickly dodging. Around the friends, someone began to move very quickly, bouncing off the walls like a rubber ball. It was impossible to keep track of the subject's movements. The enemy was bouncing off the walls, breaking the stone, but it didn't slow down. Alto couldn't catch a glimpse of him. It began to attack. The boy defended himself. He was in pain and thought that if at such a speed a bunch of attacks would fall, he would not be able to survive. Finally, the boy manages to see the silhouette of the attacker, the thought flashed through his mind that it was not a human, but a demon. Finally, the enemy landed in front of Alto, and he thought it was a hunter who had come for the magic stones. The boy took a defensive posture. The stranger stood with his back to him, ears clearly visible on his thick hair. He had a hood on his cloak, most likely covering himself with it so he wouldn't be seen. A girl with ears and a long tail appeared in front of Alta. She had collected all the food that her friends had prepared during her movement. She stands there chewing. The boy can't believe his eyes. Looking questioningly at the demoness, he doesn't understand anything. Without noticing anything, the girl continues to gorge herself on the food Alto prepared, looking indifferent. The demoness looks directly at the guy and defiantly bites the meat, pulling it off the skewer one by one. From such insolence, Alto threw into a sweat and he lost the power of speech, standing and looking at what is happening with his mouth open. Continuing to stand in a protective stance, the guy can't believe the monster in front of him. The girl continues to stand still and just eats. Finally, the girl speaks and introduces herself. Her name is Majika. She is a traveler and wants to know who Alto is. Standing wide-eyed, Alto told the girl his name, now realizing that she doesn't look like a monster and is a friendly enough person. The girl informs, noticing Alto's gaze on her cute ears, that he is from a tribe of squirrels. Has he ever heard of such a thing? Majika waved her tail playfully, showing her kinship with the squirrels. Without letting the boy say a word, the girl continued on, saying that she didn't care, though. Alto looked at her questioningly, for there was no food left in her hands. Now confused and with his hands down, the boy looked at the empty space where Majika had stood a moment ago. She was gone in a flash. Instantly behind the boy, the girl is already sitting by the fire, reaching for another skewer of meat. Alto stands as if stumped and confused, hearing that the girl wants to finish the meat. Alto barely turns his head in her direction. She asks why so and where is she. The boy sees the picture. Coming to his senses, 
Alto muttered indignantly that he never heard Majika, please. And the slime takes away her leftover food. The girl doesn't give it back. The company moved on their way. The guy turns around and sees that the slime is sitting on the girl's shoulder. And the girl smiling and playing with her is following. The guy asks why she's following him, to which he gets the answer that he's just a kid and she has to go to Kinotogris, so she goes with him. Alto asks, isn't Majika herself a child yet? In response, he hears that if you look grown up, you are still a child. The boy thought that he was already an adult and stopped in indecision. An idea popped into Alto's head. Although he was going to go alone, he changed his mind. The boy suggests going together with a happy face. That way the time would pass faster. Super right? He's obviously up to something. Keeping the path all ready with the three of them, Alto exclaimed happily, pointing his finger forward. He says he can see the city. The girl follows with a blank expression on her face. The three travelers have reached a place where they have a view of the city of Kinotogris. Moving on, they reach the first stone gate of the city. Alto put his hand, which had a bracelet on it, to the censor to confirm his identity. Entering the city, the friends made their way into the city to the main street, where they were greeted with happy smiles and told welcome to the city. Since ancient times, Kinotogris has meant chaos, a great diversity of races, humans, dwarves, elves, and beasts alike reside here. It's all about the dungeon that rises in the center. People fascinated by this dungeon, one by one, gather in this city. Majika huffed and grabbed her hood with her hand. She began to look around with a confused and surprised look. Alto noticed the change in her companion, asked her what was wrong, and she said she was worried because it was the first time she had seen so many people. The boy tried to calm her down, saying that he was from the village, and she replied that she lived on the street. The boy shared with the girl that he was nervous when he first came to the city. Majika looked at him with disbelief. Alto hesitated as the companion mentioned that from what Alto said, he hadn't been here. He was confused, but stuck it out when he said he was here with his parents. The boy looks around, remembering that he was ten years old when he was first here, feeling that the city is alive and almost nothing has changed. The boy wondered. He wondered what would happen in the next two years. We had to be careful. Majika interrupted his thoughts by asking where they should go next. Looking at the food stall and the prices, the guy decided they should go to the Adventurer's Guild. They need money to live in the city. Alto asked Majika if she would go with him, to which she said yes without a doubt. The travelers finally reached a building with the emblem of a trade guild. Once inside, the friends saw a small line of people wanting to trade their items for something more valuable. The boy, happy and satisfied, immediately wanted to exchange the magic stones he had gotten on his way to the city. The unfamiliar young elf informed him that the boys had come to the wrong place with a smile on his face. The joyful light in Alto's eyes changed abruptly to a sad one. He didn't understand why they wouldn't accept the stones here. The ward worker waved the boy away with a disgruntled look and told him to get lost. This was no place for children, and they should leave. The boy tilted his head so that he was almost invisible and started rustling something. Soon lifting the bag over the counter, Alto flipped it over and shook out a mountain of magic stones. As the employee looked away from the counter, he couldn't even realize what it was. The stones of varying value were shimmering on the table. Alto had to stand on his toes to talk to the peddler. He asked where they had gotten so many stones, and the boy said that he had gotten them on a hunt. The boy decided to lie, saying that he had defeated Majika, but he didn't know how to sell magic stones. The worker froze in amazement. The girl started to say she had nothing, but the boy covered her mouth with his hands and quietly asked her to be quiet. He felt embarrassed. The worker looked at the magic stones with a mesmerized look. He didn't expect that children could bring such a thing to his guild. The changeling changed his face, contorted his face with a sly grin, obviously thinking of something. The worker gives two gold coins, 29 silver coins, and 85 copper coins for the stones, totaling 1,990. The tired Alto collects the coins in his bag. He is exhausted and wonders if he is exhausted because he is a child or because of his height. The restless kid approached the worker again, asking if he could register as a seeker. The changeling hesitated. When asked why a child was registering as an adventurer, Alto paddled and gestured at Majika, saying he was an AVS. The girl hesitated, and Alto said she should register because she had a big case. Majika wanted to object, but Alto stopped her, once again clasping her hands over her mouth and asked the employee to register them faster since they didn't have time. The companions walked out of the guildhouse frowning in complete silence, and finally Majika called out to Alto, approaching from behind as close to the guy's ear as possible. Majika grudgingly asked if he had taken it with him to use. 
Alto faltered. At Alto's age, it's hard to explain some things, so he asked for help and apologized. Isn't it smart to waste time buying magic stones? Alto's actions don't improve his reputation, and Majika isn't happy. He stopped and asked again with a sad face. The guy smiled sadly and said that reputation doesn't bother him, since increasing it, you don't get stronger. The meaning of Alto's said words reached Majika. She opened her eyes understandingly and surprised. The boy offered to find an inn since they now had money, thanked the girl for her help and offered to eat together. Alto suggested that Majika might have other things to do and offered to say goodbye right there. It became apparent that the girl had become sad and lowered her eyes. The companion agreed to go with the guy for a reason, asking for either money or they spend time together in his room. Alto grinning agreed. The companions found an inn for a night's lodging as darkness fell on one of the city streets. As they approached the building, Alto told the girl that he was glad she had come with him and at first thought Majika would refuse. Sitting in a large room with two beds, Majika confessed, because she looks like a waif, many roads are closed to her. With a smile on his face, Alto changed the topic of conversation and said that this inn had delicious food and Majika would like it too. The girl was surprised. The girl hesitated and Alto noticed it and immediately asked with a smile what was the matter. Majika replied that nothing and decided to take a bath. The girl started to take off her clothes and threw them on the bed next to the slime. The guy yelled for her to stop and went to undress in the bathroom. The city is asleep. The lights are no longer on in the windows. A haze of vapor wafts from behind a building. Water drips from the shower head, at which time Majika finished taking a shower. Getting dressed after bathing, the girl caught herself thinking that she was tired and it hadn't happened to her before. Pushing the thoughts of fatigue aside, Majika decided to go to bed thinking that she would eat a lot tomorrow. Walking into the room, the girl stopped with an amazed look. She saw a bright glow inside the room. Alto is sitting in the center of the bed in lotus pose and meditating. A white glow appeared around him. The girl looks at him confusedly. The guy's energy became tangible. The energy turned into two drops that swirled around each other. It was as if the energy was dancing, merging and separating. It shimmered and made sounds. Majika never moved, continuing to watch the energy dance in wonder and realized it was mana. The girl turned to the guy and thought about the fact that a human wasn't capable of such a thing and mentally asked Alto who he was. Majika traveled the world, exploring it up and down, all for the sake of finding someone. The girl had noticed that a few days ago, some kid had taken a fancy to following her. She saw him when he was fighting a bird. Majika remembers Alto swinging weapons and destroying monsters and seems strong beyond his years. The girl notices that the guy's skills are like nothing she's ever seen before, when she touches the ground, she fails and the monsters fall into a deep hole. To test Alto and his skills, Majika decides to get close to him and attacks him. It seems that he has some sort of secret. Majika remembers Alto's words about how nervous he was when he first came to town. The girl also remembers the moment when the guy confidently stated that one of the inns had good food. Majika is surprised by everything Alto does because he talks and acts like an adult. The girl hopes that maybe Alto is the one she is looking for the one who can change this world. Looking at Alto, the girl remembers the star prediction that a hero will come to this world in the body of a girl, and it is impossible for a boy to be that hero. The girl has a feeling that the boy will be the key that opens the doors of the new world. This feeling excites the girl. The moonlight illuminates the room. The young people are lying on their beds. Majika is completely covered with a blanket. Alto sleeps on top of the blanket, exhausted. Majika can't sleep. She watches the boy and realizes that when the mana disappeared, the boy collapsed like a murdered man. The girl lies there wondering why the boy is so exhausted from training. She has the impression that someone is chasing him. Suddenly, in the complete silence, the window sash began to creak, letting her know that someone was opening the window. Majika lies there, horror in his eyes, but he doesn't even move, sensing someone's energy. Lying still, the girl mentally asks who is here. She can feel someone has already entered the room and is heading towards Alto. Majika assumes it's the thief who has infiltrated, but his presence is barely felt. He must be low level. The girl watches the enemy who is quietly moving forward. She could chase him away, but wants to see how Alto would cope in such a situation. The hooded foe starts to stretch his arms. You can see one eye burning red in the darkness. Just a little more and the stranger reaches. The speed of the arms increases. Full of anger and determination, the stranger shifts his gaze to Alto. With a quick movement of his hand, the enemy pulls out a knife and prepares to attack. Hovering over the boy with a grin, the enemy with the weapon lunges sharply at Alto, part of his face hidden by his hood. 
Majika, agitated by what is happening, calls out to Alto, jumping off her bed and pulling back the blanket. Alto sits motionless. His enemy has a knife pressed to his throat, but suddenly freezes, feeling no resistance. The robber warns Alto not to move, and if the guy acts like an adult, he won't hurt anyone. Majika is ready to attack and asks what the enemy wants. She's about to pounce on the mugger. Alto smilingly answers for the enemy. He knows he wants the money and asks how he knows he has it in his bag. The robber freezes. The stranger, surprised by this reaction, is at a loss for words and begins to stammer, trying to explain his presence. Alto offers to talk, throwing off his blanket in the direction of the enemy, swirls a ball of energy in his hand, and rushes to attack, saying that he is no thief. Hitting the thief with the air cannon, the thief flew away. The girl, not expecting such a thing, huddles on her bed. With a shockwave, the blankets fly all over the room. The burglar flies toward the window and out of it into the street, screaming as he does so, followed by the rumble of a fallen body. Magica goes to the window and asks Alto if everything is all right. He shakes off his hands and replies that everything is fine. Looking out the window, the girl notices that the guy is using incredibly complex magic and sees that the enemy has flown beyond the neighboring house. Majika realizes that one awkward move and this magic can kill a person. The thought makes her tail stand up. Swallowing, the girl wonders how much Alto has trained to reach this level at his age. Turning to the boy, she calls his name, but he is already sound asleep, exhausted after using magic. Noticing that Alto is asleep, the girl's jaw involuntarily drops, and she thinks that this boy will definitely become famous in many ways. The knife of the failed robber remains on the floor of the room. The morning comes, and the friends gather around the table, which is bursting with a variety of dishes. Grabbing a spoon, Alto happily asks Mahika how she likes the food, if it's really good. The people sitting in the hall look at the couple with interest and shock. The conversations begin to subside, all eyes on their companions. Unhappy at being pulled away from her meal, Majika replies that this is the most delicious thing she's ever eaten, and continues to shove the food into her mouth with both hands. Alto laughed and asked her to eat slowly, and when all the plates were empty, she thanked him for the meal. When she leaves the tavern, Mahika clutches her stomach and says that she is full. The boy notices that the girl has eaten for ten people since morning. The friends move on and Majika asks what's next. Alto replies that the truth is he plans to go to the dungeon, but there is one more thing to do. Alto shows the knife and explains that yesterday's intruder worries him, and so they need to look somewhere else. The companions return to the trade guild to ferret out information about weapons. Once inside, Alto greets them with a smile, folding his hands behind his back as if nothing had happened. The employees sitting at the desk turned their heads toward him. One of them confused and dropped his pen on the document, spilling ink. A man who looked like a client stared at the boy in surprise, and the ward worker stared angrily, recognizing the kid from yesterday. The worker tries to brush it off and says he's talking to his boss, and if he has business to attend to, he should come back later. And Alto wants to talk to the boss. The boy deliberately makes a pensive face and suggests that there is a thief in the guild. The chief is intrigued wants to know what the boy is talking about and asks him to tell more details, shifting his attention to the child. Alto starts to tell how yesterday some suspicious guy broke into their room, but luckily he was scared off. The worker was visibly nervous. His hands were sweating. He swallowed and pulled himself into a line after Alto said that the target was the money from the stones sold to the guild. The boy says that the culprit knew exactly where the money was, since he hadn't rummaged through the room, or he wouldn't have guessed to look in the child's bag either. Alto leaned on the table and pronounced that the robber could only be someone who was in the guild at the time of the transaction, and the warden agreed that this could be the case. The chief looks at the employee and asks if he was in charge, then Leon flinches and nervously confirms that he was working that day. The chief asks if there was anyone suspicious in the guild at the time. Leon is confused and says he doesn't even know. Maybe there was and maybe there wasn't. The boss demands the employee to speak more clearly in an orderly tone and he replied that there was no one, Alto at the same time watching boredly from the sidelines. The guy points at Mahika and says she managed to brandish the perpetrator while dealing with him. The girl stands shocked. Alto warned that if he noticed a man with a magic mark on his arm, he should be apprehended, and here Leon got completely wet. Unnoticed by the others, the guild worker begins to slowly lower his sleeve, hiding the sign from those present. Not thinking long, the boy put with a clatter something on the table in front of the boss. The employee realizes that he has been exposed. The boy put the dagger lost by the thief on the table and said that it seemed like a good thing. 
but it would be better to hand it over to the gendarmes as evidence. The chief agreed that the dagger would help in the search for the thief. Leon jumped up and said pitifully that it might be better to keep it. The worker began to think of a way to keep the dagger. Supposedly, there is a rule that you can keep the thing of a defeated opponent. It is a pity to give it away. The boss agrees with Leon, and he immediately jumped up to Alto to hand the dagger to him and asked him to take care of it, because it is very expensive. Going outside, Majika realized that the worker is a thief, and whether it is worth leaving it like that, the guy replied. They warned them. The rest is not their concern. The girl assumes that Alto needed to get a gun, to which the guy smilingly agreed, saying that he had been figured out. The guy stopped and said that since he and the thief were done, their adventures were beginning. The friends walked up to the tower that leads to the dungeon and stopped at the portal. Staring upwards, Majika said she couldn't see the top, Alto explained. It was the labyrinth of Kinotogris, one of the greatest dungeons in the world. The companions stepped into the portal. No one knows how extensive the dungeon is. Neither does anyone know who built it or how. The couple entered the first level from the first to the 25th floor. It is quite safe to walk through it. The newcomers are already fighting here. Alto explains that mostly novice adventurers train here with the weakest monsters. The guy's attention is attracted by a strange noise coming from the side. He took his gaze there. A monster escapes from the top floor. The adventurers shout to Alto to run because his magic is not enough to deal with it. The monster runs straight at the guys. Someone yells that there's a child and advises them to run away. But Majika is in a defensive posture, and Alto doesn't move. The monster is speeding towards his companions, Alto calmly waiting for the moment to attack. The guy closes his eyes and casts a spell. He is unfazed and calm. Alto stretches his arm forward and the floor in front of them collapses. The monster falls into this hole and flies down. Majika stares at what is happening with her mouth open, speechless and the guy notices that he was able to calculate the forces and did not hurt the others. The adventurers look at the broken floor and ask where the huge hole came from. It doesn't look like an earthquake. There was no shaking. Alto and Majika go on the run, saying that the floor suddenly collapsed and they were lucky, because the hole is very deep. Running away, the guy asked to be careful. Majika wondered why Alto didn't say it was his doing. He replied that no one would believe him, so it was better to run to the upper floors. The friends run to the 26th floor, this is the middle level. They say from here the real labyrinth begins. So far the corridors are empty. The guys are attacked by a huge monster, but Majika hits him in the stomach with a powerful punch, accelerating before the attack and taking a place under the monster. Alto walks over and admires the girl, for he defeated it with a single blow. In response, she huffed that the boy was a good fighter too. Alto looked forward with concentration and drew his dagger, thinking it was time to put it to the test. At this moment, his dexterity skill increased by ten. Holding the dagger in his hand, the guy had no idea that it was so effective. Guy wished he could see the skill board with the progression, but for now, he could feel it. Alto thought the dagger would definitely come in handy when picking out equipment. Continuing forward, the boys come to a cave-like corridor, all studded with beautiful crystals. In the depths of the dark cave, they hear the sounds of blades striking and see sparks where the blades hit each other. Alto starts a fight with the skeleton monster. Jumping on his chest, he pierces him with his dagger. The skeleton flies backwards and drops his weapon. The boy notices four more skeleton monsters running at him with burning. He decides to use a mana-filled orb to attack. The boy didn't hit the skeletons with mana. He decides to hit the stone wall with energy to cause a rockfall. Alto's blow shook the wall and huge crystals rained down, falling loudly and raising dust clouds. Rocks and crystals rained down from the ceiling onto the skeletons breaking them like houses of cards and piling them with their weight. Alto himself did not expect such a result, exhaling loudly as he stared with surprised eyes at the result of his attack. The travelers have reached the 50th floor. From here, the upper level begins. This is a high danger zone where not everyone is capable of fighting. Putting his hand to his head as if looking over the horizon, Alto notes that with each floor, the strength of the monsters will increase. First, we need to raise the level here. Majika tenses up and looks at the guy with wide eyes. The girl is concerned as to why Alto fights monsters the normal way. The guy doesn't immediately realize what she means. Alto gets curious and pounces on Majika asking her to teach him the unusual way of fighting monsters. Majika replies that that's not what she meant. The monsters he just defeated were powerful, and she can't believe they were defeated by a boy. The girl can't get it out of her head. How come the boy is so strong? Not every strong adventurer can defeat such monsters. Alto asks if this is all weird. The girl replies that, of course, pointing her hand to her side. The guy looked at the girl with amazed eyes and asked why she was so surprised. For him, strength is the norm. 
Alto opened his eyes wide and realized that the girl was the second person who was able to see the real him. Before that, no one recognized him except Hannah. The boy remembers how in his past life reaching level 99, he had to fight alone even with dragons. Alto watches the backs of others, for no one would even look in his direction, considering his life low. The loneliness was eating him up. The boy is shrouded in shackles, pulling his arm, screaming and feeling fear, but so alone, such is the law of this world. Standing across from each other, the boy realizes that it turns out there are people other than Hannah who do not obey the law. When asked if Alto was a human being, he laughingly replied that he was a hundred percent, though it was hard to believe it, because he had died and been reborn. Walking forward and destroying monsters, the level of the boy quickly rose. Behind the companions remains a trail of knuckles and skulls of defeated enemies. At a certain level, going up the steps, Alto noticed that he could now defeat monsters from the 50th floor, and they could go higher. Stepping onto one of the steps, the boy wondered if his memory serves him right, there must be something here. Stepping out of the labyrinth with Majika, they gingerly look ahead and leisurely move on, waiting for another attack. As they turn the corner, Majika freezes, looking fearfully in front of her. They come upon a monster that is several times larger than the boys, with burning red eyes, huge fangs and horns. It is a small ogre. He notices the uninvited guests, and the guy remembers that in his past life, he had to sweat a lot to take him down. The friends took a fighting stance right in front of the orc, the boy wondering how fast he could overpower him now with his new abilities. Magica, still looking at the monster, fearfully realized that the monster is eager to kill. Many adventurers have ended their journey here. The orc stands looking angrily at the boys, holding a huge sword in his hand. He is enveloped by vicious flames. His level is completely different. The girl resolutely clenched her fist and offered to come in from the rear, but Alto firmly refused. He has his own scores to settle with this monster. Preparing to attack, Alto confidently stated that he would fight alone and begins to pull out his dagger. Majika enters the argument, not realizing what the guy is carrying, after all. One mistake and he's dead. The guy knows this, but doesn't give in. Going one-on-one -on -one with the orc, who is already growling, Alto realizes that this is a chance to test how strong he really is. The boy jumps up sharply, pushing himself off the ground without giving the girl a second thought. With a confident look and without a drop of fear, holding the dagger in one hand and pulling the other towards the enemy, he flies straight at the monster. The monster opened its jaws to track the guy's movements. And with all his might, Alto flew above the orc and swung his dagger to strike from above. The boy struck the orc on the shoulder with his dagger. A distinctive sound was heard and the orc recoiled slightly. The boy only managed to scratch the orc's neck slightly. His skin was thick, as if it were metal. The orc himself stood as if nothing had happened. With a wild roar, he swung his sword and attacked the boy, barely managing to dodge. With the tip of his sword, the orc hits Alto on the cheek, leaving a wound and cutting off a strand of hair. The boy's eyes widened in horror at the surprise. Falling to the ground, the boy pushed back with his hand and thought, if he didn't wound the orc, it doesn't mean the attack had no effect. Alto naively thinks that if he hits the same spot, a good thing might come out. The beast growls in rage. Many times, the boy hits the enemy's neck, blow after blow. At breakneck speed, he swerves around the enemy and slashes at the same spot. Finally, Alto manages to defeat the enemy. His head was separated from his body and the burning eyes of the orc went out. The huge, lifeless body falls to the ground with a clatter. Alto tiredly exhales with relief. He is victorious. Taking a breath, the guy hears Majika's denial. She stands with rounded eyes and looks towards the fallen enemy. The girl can't believe her eyes and continues to deny reality. She believes the boy won too easily. Gulping in air with his mouth, Alto thinks that he doesn't have to exert himself either, but perhaps this is the limit of his current strength. Hearing a familiar sound, the boy smiled and turned around to see the slime already dragging the magic stone left behind after the orc's death towards him. The boy said that only high-rank monsters had such large stones. Exhaling, he suggested that it was probably time for them to go. Alto smiling again, sitting on the ground with slime on his lap, turned Tosmajika and called out to her, but she was silent. The boy calls out to the girl again and asks if she can hear him. She stands with clenched fists, does not turn to him and does not say a word. With her ears perked up nervously and her eyes drooping, the Majika still called out and asked what the sound was. Alto turned, looked behind Majika, pressed the slime to his side and rounded his eyes. The boy's eyes rounded with horror, his heart racing, he called the girl's name again and told her to run away from here fast. Now Majika's heart was racing too. She said they couldn't run. If they moved, they would die. 
Out of the darkness, the silhouette of another monster appeared. From the darkness of the maze, a clawed green hand with rags around its wrist reached out to them. Freezing in place, the friends see a one-eyed monster emerge from the cave, many times the strength of the orc. An ominous roar rings out in the silence of the cave. It's a green ogre, a monster wrapped in magical ivy. The ivy itself is a low-level monster. It parasitizes other higher-level creatures and sucks their power. Alto is shocked by the appearance of this terrifying monster. He is tormented by the question of what a 70th-level monster is doing on a 50th level. Normal monsters start appearing 10 floors higher. The boy was not sure about defeating the small one. Alto jumped up, stuffed the slime into his bag, and told Majika to catch the moment to escape. The girl stands as if mesmerized. Majika still firmly refused to run. Now she was filled with determination, wanting to show off her abilities too. The boy, dumbfounded by such a statement, looked at her with his mouth open in amazement. The girl also possesses mana and began to gather it into a tightly clenched fist. She knows that this monster is strong. Believing in herself, the girl declared that this enemy too has a limit. Rushing into battle, she was completely transformed, becoming confident and glowing. Majika recalls how she trained hard with her teacher to become a worthy partner for the hero she seeks. The girl is strong in everything. She has no equal, no one and nothing can defeat her. Gaining energy in her body, Majika thinks that when she met Alto, she finally realized that her efforts were not enough. The girl sprang off the ground with lightning speed to deliver the first blow to the ogre. Majika chose a spot to strike on the monster's body, her attention first drawn to the monster's chest. In a matter of seconds, she was over the monster's head. It raised its head and opened its mouth. Majika shouted that she would not lose and swung her mana-covered fist confidently to strike the monster. The girl swung her mana-covered fist at the ogre's face with all her might, flying past it at breakneck speed. Gritting her teeth, Majika watched the monster and thought it was her duty to defeat it. Hitting the beast, the girl bounced to a safe distance. Her move had angered the monster, and it was trying to trample her with its paws. Watching the monster's reaction, Majika realized that there was little to no effect from her attack. Eyes wide open, he thinks out a plan. The monster's visage grows more furious as it stares directly at the girl with one of its glittering eyes. Furious, the monster leans to the ground, leaning with one hand and tries to strike with his fist. The girl manages to deftly dodge the enemy's attack. Majika bounced far enough to avoid being hit by the flying rocks, which shattered when the ogre's fist hit the floor of the cave with a powerful blow. The girl had an advantage. She began to flicker around the enemy with lightning, for she was fast and agile. Majika began to dash around the monster very quickly, hitting it every part of its body, causing it to fall to its knees and roar. The damage from one attack is not enough, so he has to do several of them, speeding up and hitting it again and again. The girl increases his speed and demands himself to move even faster. At maximum speed, he finds himself behind the monster's back. Suddenly, Ivy stretched from the monster's body. Like living vines, it reaches for Majika. Protecting its host, the ivy wrapped around the girl's body. She was bound before reaching the monster and couldn't move. Screaming and summoning the devil, Majika finds herself trapped, entangled in the ivy, a spark of anxiety and confusion in her eyes. Resisting, the girl felt the ivy completely wrapped around her body. She looks puzzled and lost. The parasite begins to tighten its knot around the girl more and more, and she begins to scream, closing her eyes in pain. Alto comes to the rescue. With his air blade, he cuts the ivy and frees her from the trap. She falls down surprised. The boy prepared to fight the monster with his dagger. The monster stands in a puff of dust, while the girl continues to fall bound. One more deft movement and Majika is freed from the ivy. Alto cuts it into small pieces. Once free, the girl deftly lands on the ground, spinning in the air, looking at the pieces of cut ivy. Falling exhaustedly to her knees, Majika sees a guy land nearby. Alto turns around with a satisfied smile, asking how she is. He is worried about his companion and doesn't give her any reason to get discouraged. The girl answered the boy with a smile and thanked him for his help. Regret read on her face. Majika clenches her fist tightly and thinks how pathetic she is and she was just saved by a child. Standing right in front of the rampant monster that lay in a cloud of dust, the girl gathered her thoughts again. Majika began to build up the strength in her arm again to continue the fight with the monster. Thanks to Alto, she regained her resolve. Finally gathering her strength, the girl decides to give her best and engage in a fierce battle with the monster. Majika prepares a spell of light untouched by shadow, her fist bursting with yellow flames. 
The girl asks the light to bestow the power of shining celestial bodies, and rays of light begin to form around her. The monster attacks at the same time. Invoking the artifact, Majika aims her fist at the monster with great speed, fortitude, and determination filling her. After reciting the spell, the girl summoned a rain of stars. Numerous fireballs rained down on the enemy. From such an onslaught, the monster flew upwards, breaking away from the ground at a tremendous speed. The girl fell to her knees exhausted, as she had used up all the mana for her secret spell. Majika is sure she has defeated the monster with her magic and relaxes. The angry monster comes to his senses, rises up and heads towards the girl, his huge foot hovering over the girl, about to stomp her. Majika's ears drooped. Unable to believe what was happening, she stares at the monster without making an attempt to move, terror in her eyes. The shadow of the monster's paw looms over the girl's fragile body, and she stares doomedly at its foot, unable to move. Behind Majika's back, the ground begins to crunch. She doesn't move from her spot, listening carefully to every rustle. Continuing to stand on one foot, the monster doesn't notice a crack beginning to form under his foot. Splitting in half, the crack begins to turn into a crevice, and the monster falls into it with one foot while making horrifying noises. Losing its balance, the monster fell on its back with a clatter, raising pillars of dust. Majika stares at what is happening in confusion. She doesn't realize what's going on and notices the guy. Alto stands with a penetrating stare, lips firmly locked together. His hand is stretched forward in a haze of vapor. The girl looks at the boy and says his name quietly, then doesn't take her eyes off the monster. Just a moment later, Alto picks up the dazed girl in his arms and continues to watch the monster. Without letting the girl out of his arms, Alto tears away from the monster until it frees its leg from the trap of the crevasse and comes to a stop. The boy carried the girl to safety, made her comfortable, and asks her to provide the rest to him, squatting in front of her. The slime, who was named Rue, Alto leaves as a bodyguard and asks him to keep an eye on Majika. He squeaked in agreement. The look of confusion on her face did not leave the girl. She silently gave the boy a glance as she continued to sit in her hiding place. The trapped monster is rampant. Its leg is still in a crack and it's having trouble moving. The boy looks at the beast with eyes full of confident anger, nudging his dagger as he prepares to attack again. The monster looks at the boy with burning, angry eyes and growls unhappily. With a sudden movement, Alto breaks away and flies at the monster, who in turn points the ivy at the guy, trying to catch him. The monster was so angry that a red light shone through the patch covering his other eye, and ivy came from all parts of his body. The boy deftly dodges the blows of Ivy, quickly maneuvering between these whips. He purposefully carries on the monster. The boy realizes that his speed is slower than Majika's, and since this is the case, he must try his best. Losing his guard, Alto fails to notice one of the Ivy whips. Noticing its sudden appearance, the boy moves, shocked. Not having time to dodge, the boy receives a powerful whip blow to his chest area. From surprise and pain, he squirms and goggles. The girl watching from the side loudly pronounces Alto's name. She is shocked by the force of the monster's blow. The effect of the blow was unpredictable. The guy couldn't breathe, but he gathered the strength to attack. He gathered fire energy in his hand and pressed on the ivy. It hissed. The whip catches fire, starts to blaze, and the boy manages to bounce to a safe distance. The boy begins to gather energy again as the ivy continues to ignite. Alto is out of breath and thinks that the attack should work. Ivy is ivy, even though it is magical, it is still susceptible to fire magic. The boy transfers the fire magic into the dagger and thinks that even if he burns the vine itself, the ivy will just keep regenerating. The boy jumps up and knows he needs to attack in a way that hurts the ogre. Gathering his strength, the boy rushes into the fight with a blazing dagger straight at the monster, then tries to strike at the boy again. The monster releases the ivy again. Several pieces fly towards Alto. He is thinking at this time that it won't be possible to pierce the orc's skin directly. The boy deftly cuts the vines that were in the way of reaching the monster with his fire dagger and decides he needs to take aim. Jumping over the head of the enemy, the boy found himself on the back of the ogre, while the ivy at the same time tries to strike the child. Alto saw on the monster's body the place where the ivy starts to grow from, gathered fire in his hand to burn it. The kid decides to strike at the root of the growth, and summoning a fireball, he confidently releases it on the ivy. The ogre's back catches fire, and the boy is blown backwards by the shockwave. Using the power of the fire on the ivy, the effect was unexpected. The entire head of the ogre suddenly caught fire. The flames engulfed even the mouth. The monster roared. Alto rather shakily jumped aside, watching the process carefully. 
The boy breathed gulping air with his mouth. He was exhausted from the battle with the monster and began to calm down. The strength began to leave Alto, and he began to lose consciousness, slumping to the ground. Alto fell unconscious, dropping his precious dagger, the slime flying towards him. Sparks from the fire flying around the dungeon. Sprinkled with sparks, Majika staggered over to the guy, ears perked up and looking in front of her with surprised eyes. The girl watches as the monster growls and burns and the flames don't go out. She realized that Alto had definitely won now. Majika also started to faint with the thought that Alto is just a child and defeated such a strong enemy, finally collapsing. The companions find themselves outside near the tower, opening their eyes. The first thing they saw was Rue's slime. Patting their eyes, the friends lying on the ground finally came to their senses. Majika surprised as usual, and Alto tired. The guys looked around and noticed they were on a city street. People walking by, a merchant selling goods, and a couple lying on the ground. Turning his head, Alto asked Rue, who was hustling beside them, how they had gotten here. His friends not believing that Rue could carry them, yet asked if he did, if he really could, the slime made it clear that she had helped. Alto gratefully grabbed Rue and cradled him in his arms, saying he was the world's most trustworthy companion. Turning to Majika, the boy said that it would have been dangerous to stay in the dungeon unconscious, and it was very good that they were here now. The girl remained silent. Turning away, Majika said she would be the first to return to the inn and apologized. She was upset and thoughtful. The boy smilingly agreed and said holding a lick in his hands that he too would take a little breather and would be heading back to the inn. After Majika left, Alto became serious and wondered if she could really use an artifact. Artifacts created by a god, holy tools that could be counted on fingers in their world. The one the girl used was called Star Rain. Stroking Rue and holding it in his lap, the guy remembers, if his memory from his past life does not fail him, in seven years, this artifact will die. In the present, the owner of the artifact is Majika, who quietly walks towards the inn. Night falls. The whole company has returned to the room for the night, but there is no light on in any window. Alto immediately went to the bathtub and sat in the hot water thinking about something. Majika has become the friend he didn't have in his previous life. Sweating from the steam of the bathtub, the boy stares at one point and thinks, Magica has been wielding artifact magic all this time. The girl wears a glove on her hand with a special mark, the artifact hand of justice. She is of the squirrel family. Magica, the person who possesses these two traits, was convicted in Alto's past life. According to the Vatican's decision, criminal element number five, she and five others were declared enemies of God. Machia Extet Terror stood in the courtroom. The boy recalls that it hasn't happened yet, but in the future, an order will be given to destroy them. While bathing in the bathtub, a skill scoreboard appeared in front of Alno. He looks at it in amazement and finally realized something. Looking at the point where life was shown, the boy thought that most likely Majika's life rate was four stars. In the dungeon, the boy felt the girl's magical energy surpassing him and an unbreakable barrier. The boy thinks that with the life force and the artifact, Majika must be incomparably stronger than himself. Alto mentally put himself and the girl together as the energy breathes in the two of them and notices, there it is, what a difference in the standard of living. The boy thought about what would happen in the future. Even Majika with her power would ruin the Vatican in seven years. Alto's eyes read pain. He imagines what will happen to him if the future repeats itself. The boy plunges into the water holding his breath and closing his eyes tightly, he begins to realize what a weakling he really is compared to Majika. Opening his eyes underwater and looking down, the boy wondered if he could really change his fate. Completely immersed in his thoughts, Alto didn't notice his friend Rue sinking into the bathtub. But when he did, he got scared and covered the important parts with his hands. Diving out from under the water, the boy picked up the slime with his hands, pulled it out of the water, and asked what he was doing here with a concerned face. Looking at Rue, Alto noticed that he had changed color and shape, and asked him not to tell him that the slime wanted to bathe too. The boy climbed out of the tub and took Rue with him, took a washcloth, soaped and foamed it, sat down on the bed and began to lather the slime with the copious foam. The boy laughingly explained that this time they had gotten out only because of the slime and in gratitude Alto would rub Rue to a shine, the slime squeaked in agreement. Under the sound of the pouring water, Rue's squeaks can be heard. Alto asks if he needs to stop. Does it tickle his heels? I never thought slime had heels. After bathing and cleaning, the slime shone like a diamond, shimmering with purple and blue tones. Satisfied with his work, 
Alto informed the slime that it was blinding to his eyes, and whether it always looked like that when clean. Laughing at Rue's reaction, the boy asked if she was satisfied, and the slime squeaked affirmatively, bouncing on the bathroom floor. Suddenly the slime spread across the bathroom tiles, turning into a puddle, which startled Alto, he thought. Slime can't be washed. Gathering the puddle back into a lump, the boy took it into the room where the prepared things were, and reminded him that Rue had scared him. As soon as the boy entered the room, Majika stood up abruptly, looking at the boy with a guilty look on her face and missing his head. Majika turned to the boy, looking directly at him. She decided to confess something to him. The girl invites Alto to the terrace to get some fresh air and talk. Majika sat down on a bench, tilted her head and folded her hands in her lap. The boy followed her out with two mugs of tea. He realized she had something to say. Alto noticed that Majika hadn't said a word since they had returned to the inn. He was worried that something was wrong. Holding out a single mug to the girl, the boy said that the city was very beautiful. Majika briefly agreed, just sitting there looking off into the distance. The girl accepted the offered mug of tea, but never began to speak, just staring in front of her. Majika hesitantly began her story. She turns to Alto and says that she never thought she would lose to a mage for anything. The girl is overconfident. Before she met her boyfriend, she thought that mages were no match for her, killing monsters one after another. Continuing her story, the girl admitted that her training probably made her arrogant, but now she realized it. Majika stated that she was still green, and at that time the clouds parted and the full moon came out, brightly illuminating everything around her. The girl in the moonlight told the guy in all seriousness that she wanted to dedicate her life to solo training from now on. Alto could not believe what he heard. The girl added that living next to him only favors her weakness, so she wants a separate room. If she hadn't gone with Alto, Majika would have never known about her weakness, placing the mug on the ledge. The girl thanked the guy for everything. Standing up against the boy, the girl promised that she would never lose again, then stumped the boy. He had no words to reply. The girl confidently looked forward and warned that the next time they met, she would try to become stronger than the boy. Alto stood opposite completely discouraged. He had never thought that the girl thought she was weaker than him. The boy also put his mug on the balcony railing without drinking his tea. The guy laughed merrily, covering his mouth with one hand. Majika stands there not realizing what funny thing she said. Alto quickly starts apologizing, winking at the girl, explaining his laughter by saying such strange things. Slime sits back and watches the friends, and they think that it's not about talent, whether you have it or not. The main thing is to try your best. The boys raised their mugs and clinked them in agreement. The bright moon witnessed them, and Alto said that he was not going to lose either. The friends agreed that they would meet again when each of them would be a hundred times stronger, but at that time they could not think what the future would hold. The friends are happy, smiling at each other. Rue finishes his tea on the boy's head, but no matter how much they try in the future, there is a mighty force. There is still a force in this world that can destroy them in the blink of an eye. Alto sits in his room and gathers his things. The slime is always by his side and helps if needed. The boy turned sharply to the bed where Majika used to sleep and looked over it with regret. Glancing over to where the girl had been, he sees the unmade bed made up. Alto frowned, closing his eyes, thinking about something else briefly. With the words okay and a smile to his ears, the guy decided to move on. Opening the door, he happily walked outside. Ever since leaving the inn, Alto had been losing track of time and going head over heels in training. Alto decided that first he should develop the skill of crafting and opened the ability board, practicing hard. After a long time choosing a place for training, the guy finally finds a place that is perfect for training, boasting about it. 